So today, if we could, I'd like to open up the word to uh, John, the book of John, chapter 16, verses 5 through 7. That's John 16, verses 5 through 7. And as we're turning there, I'd just like to open up in prayer. Lord, I thank you, Father, for today, Lord. I thank you for all that's going on right now in this house, Lord. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is so alive in here, Lord. And I ask, Holy Spirit, that you take over this service as you always do. I thank you, Father, for every heart that's in here today, Lord. I thank you, Father, for, the, for, for all of the, the work and the, and the things, the people, the helps, and everything that goes on in this place, Father, to make everything come together. Lord, you are awesome in this place. And we praise your mighty name, Father. I thank you, Lord, for this worship team that got up here and belted it out there, Lord. It was awesome today, Father. We could feel your presence in this place, Lord. And so, Father, I thank you as we preach the word this morning, Lord. We say thank you. We praise you. And you are welcome here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Amen. So I'm going to start off with uh, this key verse. Again, John 16, five, five, uh, verses 5 through 7. If you're there, please say amen. Amen. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So that's my key verse here today, and the title of my message is The Coming Change. According to the dictionary, the definition of change is the act or instance of making or becoming different. I'll say that again, the act or instance of making or becoming different. Well, there's all kinds of changes in the world, all different shapes, sizes, sorts of changes that we have, and everybody goes through change in one, one form or another. And uh, sometimes people will spend millions of dollars for an outward change with uh, cosmetic surgery. Other people will spend millions of dollars for an inward change through psychiatrists. But can I tell you that today, God can give you a change, and it's totally free. He gives it freely. All you have to do is receive it. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, today, of course, we're going through a change that we didn't expect. It was a coming change, but we weren't expecting this coming change, this, this COVID-19, uh, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it. This coming change we were not expecting, but it was something that we had to embrace. We had to embrace it because it was a matter of life or death. So many people have died from this, uh, from this uh, virus, and so we know that there had to be changes made. And as everyone knows, we had to shut down our homes, we had to shut down the jobs, we couldn't go to work, we couldn't even go out the door unless we were going for essentials. There was so many things that we couldn't do anymore that we did before. There were so many freedoms we had that we lost that we couldn't do be just because of something like this. Our church, the way we go to church has changed. Look at today. I mean, we're all sitting here with masks on, with social distancing going on. We have to go to the stores. We've got to wear masks when we go inside. We, you know, if, uh, the other day I went down to the Home Depot. I got all the way to the door and I forgot my mask. I literally had to turn around, go home, and get my mask. I got like five masks in my car now, so that won't happen again. <laughs> But the way we shop, the way we see our doctors. As a matter of fact, I had my doctor's appointment online. That I kind of liked because the doctor was on time. So I kind of enjoyed that one. <laughs> but uh, it's changed the sports world, obviously. It's changed our education, how we teach our kids. So much has changed because of this. Now, there are other types of changes that we go through, changes that people actually make intentionally. Uh, and maybe they didn't think it at the time, but as time went on, they were changes that we embraced. Changes like, for example, Henry Ford in the cars. How many people here had to hook up their horses to the carriage this morning? <laughs> Nobody, right? Okay. Can you imagine having to get out? You've got to clean your horse. You've got to clean up after your horse. You've got to feed your horse. You've got to make sure the shoes are on his uh, feet correctly and hook him up to the carriage. You'd have to leave three and a half hours early just to make it to church on time. <laughs> so we know that because of the advent of cars that Henry Ford and people like him had made, we just jump into our cars and it's very convenient to come to work. Thomas Edison, the same thing with the lights and Tesla and the electric and the Wright brothers with the flying of planes. Speaking of the planes, I actually was looking at an old uh, encyclopedia. And in the encyclopedia, I looked up planes. And it's said in the encyclopedia that planes will never be a major mode of transportation because they would have to be so big to carry the people they'd never get off the ground. <laughs> and look at today, right? Just the opposite is what's actually happening. Amen. Praise God. But these changes are worldwide changes. 
everything that's being done today is, is a worldwide change. We're not the only ones going through it. All of the other nations are going through it just as well. And so how about spiritual change? That's what I want to talk about next because that's change in the natural, but I want to talk more about the spiritual change. Now, according to, well, uh, I tried to find the right dictionary to find this, but believe it or not, it's not in the dictionary, except for one. It's in the Bill Lynn Dictionary. And I'm going to give you the Bill Lynn, de de the Bill Lynn definition, okay? According to Bill Lynn, the dictionary, and the Bill Lynn Dictionary, the definition of spiritual change is a change that a person goes through when he accepts Jesus as his Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the spiritual change. I'll say that again because that's important. A change a person goes through when he accepts Jesus as his or her Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. And, what it, and, and this is what follows. This is the examples that my, my dictionary gives. It's, from, it's a total transformation from death to life, from bondage to salvation, from no hope to great hope, from weak to strong, from poor to rich, from the jailhouse to the penthouse, Amen. from ordinary to extraordinary, from orphans to sons and daughters of the Most High, from slaves to royalty, from curse to bless, and the list goes on and on and on. Hallelujah. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Yes, Lord, Amen. you are awesome in this place. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Change is necessary. Change is necessary for growth. Change is necessary for success. Uh, I don't know how many entrepreneurs we have in here today, but if you're an entrepreneur and you want to open up a business, you've got to get a loan, and when you go to get a loan, you have to have a business plan. And that business plan may go out, you know, three, four, five years, whatever it is. And each time there's a goal that you're supposed to meet. And if you don't meet those goals, then your business isn't going to last very long. And so as you lay out this business plan, there are changes that occur when you're going through the business plan. As you're going through it to meet the, bowl, you, to meet the goals, you start to adjust and, and you start to tweak things a little bit more. There's changes, constantly changes being made in order to meet those goals. Well, that's the same with spiritual change. Spiritual change is the more you read the word, the more you grow. The more you grow, the more you change. And you'll see the fruits of people that are growing spiritually. You see, when somebody's growing spiritually, they do things like read their Bible. They go and they pray. They fellowship with one another. They come to church. These are people, you stand strong in that, and you'll, and you'll, you'll change everything that you do. You'll start looking at life different. You'll start looking at things different. You'll start fathering different. You'll, start, you'll be a different kind of a husband. You'll be a different kind of a brother. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a spiritual change, and we do. We go through it all the time. The more and more we learn, the more and more we start to grow. Hallelujah. So change, change. <clears throat> Back in 1980, I went into the Navy. I was 21 years old. And I had no direction in my life. I had no clue where I was going. I didn't even know what to do. I joined the Navy because I didn't have any, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And when I went into the service, it was the best thing I ever did. When I was in the service, they taught me how to be a man, how to deal with life, how to defend myself, how to respect authority, how to work with others as a team. And, and, and it gave me a great understanding about this nation's power that we had. When we used to do operations out in the Pacific Ocean, there was so many uh, war games, you would call it, that you would play with our own people, obviously, in practicing. And we'd have these jet fighters going through, and they would come down to the ocean, and you would see the spray going through, and we'd fire these 22-inch guns at this island that was way out there. And I saw that, and I said, wow. I said, you know what? I said, this nation is a superpower. And now I understand why it's a superpower. I have so much respect for the armed services and for those people that go there. I have so much respect for you. And I just thank all of you who have been in the service for your service because that is not an easy task. And because of you guys, we're free today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I had a major spiritual change in my life in 1998. When I get, in June of 1998, I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And that was the, huge, the biggest spiritual change. That was the biggest change in my life. I realized how to, be a, how to be a father when the time came to be a father and how to be a husband when the time came to be a husband. So it was, that, was, that was my biggest change in life, was my spiritual change. David had a huge change in his life, too, in the Bible. The Bible is filled with heroes that have huge changes. David had a huge change when he went into the house as a shepherd boy, and he came out anointed for the next king of Israel. Ruth went through changes from being in the field to being in a place of honor. Joseph went from the pit to the palace, and Daniel went from the lion's den to the king's advisor. Hallelujah. So we see that there's all changes that happen. But today, 
and hence the name of my message, The Coming Change. Today, I want to focus, or this morning, I want to focus on changes that the disciples had coming. <clears throat> I want to take you through a journey through the four Gospels on one important event. This event is so obvious that it makes the scripture, uh, I'm sorry, this, uh, this event is so obvious, yet it's so misunderstood. This event changed the world as only God can. And this event that brings a series of conversations that Jesus had with his disciples to show this coming change that was coming for the disciples. Hallelujah. So let's start with the Gospel of Mark. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31 through 33, you can turn there if you'd like. It's also on the uh, screen here, just for those of you that want to read along. I'm going to read this, but as I'm reading this, I'm going to break it down. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spoke this word openly. <clears throat> Jesus, for the first time, is starting to tell the disciples about his death, burial, and resurrection. He hasn't talked about this before. And I believe the reason he didn't talk about it before is because they probably would have headed for the hills. They would have said, what is this guy, crazy? We, we, we're expecting the king to come and take over Israel. This, 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 you're not the guy. Sorry, we're out of here. But it's like, you know, we, you got to speak, you got to give, you got to give milk before you give the meat, right? Yeah, exactly. And so they're feeding him, you know, so Jesus is just, he knows their thoughts, he knows everything about them, so he's feeding them little by little, and he waits towards the end of his ministry to tell them this, which uh, he's letting them know that, hey guys, listen, I'm just letting you know that they're going to, they're going to, I'm going to be suffering many things, they're going to, they're go the chief priests through the religious community, and they're going to kill me. But I'm going to rise again. Hallelujah. Now, you would think that that would be like, yes. I mean, okay, I understand you got to go through these things. But they didn't understand it. They didn't understand it. And that's the whole issue right here. Because here's what Peter said. Peter gets up and he says, it says, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Rebuke Jesus. Well, why is he rebuking Jesus? Or is he rebuking Jesus? Yes. We know he's rebuking him because, and that it's a bad thing that they heard. They didn't like what they heard. And how do we know they didn't like it? Because he's rebuking him. If he would have went up there and congratulated him, then we would have known they got it. But you see, they didn't get it. And so, cheap, so then uh, Peter goes up there and he rebukes them. Now watch this. This is, this is the part that, uh, that just blows my mind right here. Is that Jesus gets up. He, sa he says right here, But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. So look at what Jesus is doing. He's not just saying this, you know, like just haphazardly. He's making a statement, and he's getting up, and he's looking, he's, looking at his, he's looking at his disciples, and he's saying that I am going, to, that, he's, he, that Satan get behind me, for you are not mindful of the things of man, but the things, are mindful of the things of God, but things of man. He's letting them know as he's jumping up, and he's saying this thing, and he's making this big stink about it. It's not that it was a big stink. Jesus was, you know, he was, he was letting them know in a very good way that he's rebuking Satan and he's telling Satan to stop messing with their minds because that's what's happening. Satan's trying to get Jesus and he's trying to get through him through the, he's trying to get to him through the disciples. If he can get the if, if Satan can't do it himself, he'll try to use somebody else. How many of you know when you're walking in your Christian life that there's people that are going to try and take you out of the things of God? Amen. He's going to make it. They're going to tell you, oh, don't go there. That stuff brainwashes you. That does this and that does that. That's all nonsense. That's nonsense. But that's why it's important that we stay in the Word of God, that we read, that we come to church, that we fellowship that we pray. If you keep doing those things, those people will not pull you out. Some people say it's easier to pull a Christian into the world than it is to pull the world into the Christian. But you know what? That's not true if you're in God's word because you'll stand strong and nobody can take you out of God's hand. Hallelujah. You know who you are in Christ. So I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing now. But notice here, Peter did not take the news too well. But neither did the others. And here's what I think happened. Okay, so we go back 2,000 years ago now, right? Now you got all of these group of disciples and they're all sitting there and they're listening to Jesus talk about this thing. And they're all amongst themselves probably saying something like, what, is he kidding me? Is Jesus kidding me? Is he really think he's going to die? We'll take care. We're, we're going to protect him. Don't worry about it. He's going to be all right. Jesus will be fine. He's, he, he, we got this. We got this. And so he goes, John, you go and tell him. I ain't going to tell him. James, you go tell him. I'm not to Andrew, you tell him. I'm not telling him. Peter, you go tell him. Oh, man, why do I got to tell him? Last time I had to walk on the water. Now I got to tell him this? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so he goes up there and he says, and he rebukes Jesus. And 
Of course, Jesus says, you know, Satan, get behind me. He wasn't yelling, he wasn't rebuking Peter. He wasn't rebuking the disciples. He was rebuking Satan. But he was using it, he was using it as an example. He was showing them as an example that follow what I do. Satan, get behind thee. For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so now we're going to look at it from the perspective of Matthew. Now, I love Matthew's version of it because he adds a little bit more to the story. You see, as you go through the Gospels, they add a little bit more to the story, and it makes a whole picture. And then you can see everything nice and clear. And so in Matthew 16, 21 through 23, that's where I am. And again, it's up on the, on the screen. 21, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. See, exact same thing. This is the same event. It's the same day. It's just a different, it's just a different uh, point of view from Matthew. It's from his perspective rather than Mark's perspective. And this is what he adds to it. And I love this because now we know what Peter said. He said, 22, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, which is where it ends in Mark. So we don't know what Peter said, but now we know what Peter said. He said, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Whoa, should not happen to you. Do you get it? Do you get it? This shall not happen to you? That does, can I, I can understand why Jesus kind of jumped in there and told Satan to get behind him. Because what he's saying in essence is, oh no, you're, you're not going to die. In other words, salvation isn't going to be, you're not going to die, you're not going to die, you're not going to go to the cross. You know, the Holy Spirit's not going to come. You know, none of these things are happening. See, they don't realize that's what they're saying, but that's what they're saying. They're saying because they're saying you can, he has to die. He has to die. That's a part of what he's doing. That's why he came here. And so he says, Satan, get behind thee, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God. You see, Jesus stuck, stuck, to, his, stuck to his guns. Jesus stood on his word. He knew what he was supposed to do. And he was being an example for those disciples, even though they weren't taking his uh, very well. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, as we, we're listening, as we see what's going on, we see how Peter's getting upset and everything, and we see, why is it? Why is it that the disciples are not getting it? Why are they not understanding it? Well, if we go to Luke, he gives us the answer there. In Luke 9, 43 through 45, now just before I get to uh, verse 43 and I start it, I want to give a little background because it explains verse 43. This is the point where uh, the, there was a demon-possessed boy and this man came and he tried to get the disciples. They couldn't get this, this demon out. And so Jesus goes over there and he's like, oh, you people, you men of little faith, you know, how much am I going to have to stick, stick around with you guys, you know? Because he's, he's frustrated that they, you know, they, they have the power to do this, but they're just not getting it. And he's, so he goes up there and as the boy starts coming to him, he throws himself on the ground and uh, convulsing on the ground. And evidently, the boy must have been hurt really bad when this was happening. Because when Jesus got there, he rebuked the, the demon, the demon left. And then he healed the boy. He healed him and then gave him to his, to his father. Okay, so that's what was going on. So verse 43 says, and all were astonished at what he just did. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of man. But they did not understand this saying. It was concealed from them that they should not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about this saying. That's why they weren't getting it. It was concealed from them. Why was it concealed from them? They weren't mixing their faith with what Jesus was saying. You see, if they were mixing their faith with what Jesus was saying, they would understand that he has to die, that he has to go to the cross, and they would love him, and they would, they would understand it, but instead they don't. It's, it's closed off to them because all they see is the bad. They're looking at the negative. They're not looking at the positive. And so they're seeing that Jesus is going to die. There goes our rabbi. Oh, what's going to happen now? Well, there's a coming change that's supposed to happen, but they don't want the coming change. They want Jesus to stay. They want to protect him. They want to keep him. They don't want their master to go. But look at what Jesus says in verse 44. Let these words sink into your ears, for the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of man. What he's saying is let it sink into your ears. What you're hearing, now this is the second time, okay? It's the same kind of event. It's about the death, burial, and resurrection. 
But it's a, it's a different time. It's the second time. Three times Jesus told them about the death, burial, and resurrection. So this time, he's telling them, let it sink. Let it sink into your ears. Let it go into your ears. Let it sink in and, and, and go into your heart so that you can understand what I'm trying to say to you. He's really trying to emphasize about what he's supposed to do. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so now we come back to my key verse in John. John 16, 5 through 7. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? Well, they're not asking him because they're afraid of the answer they're going to get. They're looking at the negative. They don't want to know. They want him to stay. That's all that's kind of in their minds. They don't want to know where he's going. And Jesus even, and that's why they got so much sorrow in their heart. And Jesus says to him, goes, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart because they don't want this to happen. But he says, nevertheless, nevertheless, even though you're telling me that you don't want me to go, even though you're trying to keep me from going from what my destiny is supposed to be, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will not send them to you. That's the reason. That's the whole crux of Jesus' life on earth and going to heaven. That's it right there, the Holy Spirit. He could, you know, when Jesus was on the cross and he said it is finished, it was finished. On earth, it was finished. But he had to go to heaven to be glorified. He had to be glorified before he could send the body. That was the, that was the part that, he, that, 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 that needed to happen and only could happen when he died. And so when he died and he went to the Father, now he sent the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now everything comes into place. But Amen. hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. But let's just pretend for a second, just for one second, let's just say, you know what? The disciples, man, they somehow figured out how to hold Jesus back. And they didn't let him go where he was supposed to go. Well, then you know what? If Jesus never left, the Holy Spirit would have never came. Right. Pentecost would have never existed. James would have not been the first pastor of the church of Jerusalem. Right. Peter would have never led 3,000 souls to Christ on that very first day of Pentecost. Saul would have never became Paul. <laughs> Praise God. Peter would have never saw the scroll vision for the salvation of the Gentiles on the rooftop. And then Cornelius' family, the, the, uh, the Roman soldier and his family, would have never got salvation. John would have never been the revelator. The letters to Romans and Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and all, they, in fact, it would have never existed. The whole new covenant wouldn't have existed. That's right. The church story in the book of Acts would have never taken place. You know we're part of that church story? Amen. Hallelujah. Because the book of Acts is not closed yet. It's still open and we're still being saved. Hallelujah. And maybe we can get somebody in that book of Acts today for some time this morning. Hallelujah. You see, Jesus had to go to the Father. He had to go. He had to go. He built his ministry. He prepared his people. He went as far as the Father would allow him to go. Jesus left capable people behind. They, were, they, they knew what to do after the Holy Spirit came. They knew exactly what to do. Jesus left them all full instructions and they did their job. There had to be a coming change. And it was important because it was for all mankind, this coming change. You see, now when Jesus goes to the Father, he's the center of all of us. He's the center. It's because every, every believer has, is Christ-centered now. So many people Christ-centered right now. That's why Jesus said that we'll do even greater works than he. Amen. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, he said, he said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. So you see, it was God's timing to send Jesus and God's timing to take Jesus. When Jesus died, the disciples thought the party was over. When Jesus' feet hit the road, he, went, he set his face like flint and went straight for the cross. He did not waver. When the disciples' feet hit the road, they ran 12 different directions. <laughs> But can I tell you that when they saw him alive and well, when they saw Jesus was raised from the dead and he spent those 40 days with them, their whole attitude changed. They weren't afraid to die anymore. Now they died the martyr's death. I mean, every one of them, even John. Well, John didn't die, but he, they tried to, but he, it didn't work. But the point is, is that they weren't afraid anymore. Now they got it, and they got it because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came, and it reminded them, which I'm going to get into in a second here. But when they saw him first live, I think they finally understood that his entire ministry, that it was clear to them that Jesus was not only who he said he was, but he did what he said he was going to do. Hallelujah. And so Jesus, when, now when the Holy Spirit came, after 10 days after Jesus, this, this part here, this, this is another one i got to say right here. 
There was 500 people that day that Jesus ascended into heaven, but only 120 were in the upper room. Now, here's the interesting thing. I kind of think, like, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm just surmising here, that maybe the 500 went to the upper room. And then all of a sudden, they started standing around going, man, my sundial, <laughs> when is this guy coming? I'm waiting for this Holy Spirit guy, but where is he? And then all of a sudden, well, you know what? I can't wait any longer, guys. I got to go. And so maybe another 50, 60 people walk out the door. The next day, you know, I got relatives coming tomorrow. I can't wait here all day. I got to go. Another 100, maybe 30 people go. Maybe another 100, you know, for something else. It's, you know, sometimes we're always looking for excuses not to, not to get into God's house or to God's word. You know what I mean? We're looking for, we're, we, we got things that we want to do that we want to get to. And it says, and maybe that's what happened. And then Jesus said, that's why I'm giving them 10 days. Because at the end of 10 days, the people out of there, I know they're going to stay. And there they were, 120 that stayed. And they were there, they, praise God, because of those 120 people and because of what Jesus did on the cross, we're here today and have that available to us. A free gift, hallelujah. You don't have to pay for it. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, praise God. So in Mark, we saw Jesus explaining about the coming change. And in Matthew, we saw that Peter was resisting change with his words. And in Luke, we see Jesus saying these words that they must sink into their ears, that it's got to sink into their heart, trying to explain it to them again. But now we will see in John how Jesus pulls it all together by explaining to the disciples all they need to know, they need to know in order to embrace the coming change. So let's look at the Gospel of John and let's see what he saw and heard. Uh, it is the Gospel that Jesus addresses all of their concerns. Okay, John, uh, John 14, 25 through 29. This is like the best part because this is the meat and potatoes right here. He's giving them the meat and potatoes. Remember before he was giving them the milk and everything? He started to give them a little bit of meat. They're not taking it too well. But now he's just like kind of force feeding them almost. <laughs> but he's saying, these things I have spoken to you while I am still alive with you. Why does he say that? He says that because he wants them to remember. He wants them to remember. He's going over and over again. I'm telling you these things so that you're with you. But the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. This is 26, verse 26. But the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and what? Bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Hallelujah. You get it? So now, he, now they're, starting, they're hearing it. They're hearing it. Jesus is making it so real to them that when the time comes that this stuff happens, they go, oh man, that's what Jesus said was going to happen. That's exactly what he said. And now I remember what he was talking about. You see, now they're going to be the men of God that they're supposed to be. But beforehand, they ran every... Remember, when Jesus died, they all took off. But when he became alive and when he, when he sent the Holy Spirit, it changed everything. It changed the world. It changed the world. Hallelujah. 27, he says this to his disciples, I peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, as I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, nor uh, neither let them be afraid. He's telling them, look, don't worry about it, guys. It's going to be okay. I'm telling you right now. I know you're not believing what I'm saying right now. I know you're having a hard time understanding it. But it's going to come. And when you see it, you're going to remember it. And when you remember it, you're going to do the things that I've sent you out to do. Amen. Hallelujah. So in verse 28, he says, You heard me say to you, I go away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, see, if you love me. If they understood it, they would have, they, they, they would have, they, they would have embraced it. But they didn't embrace it. He says, If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place so that when it does take place, you may believe. You see, again and again he's telling them. So now he's drilled it into them. He's gave them a whole plate full of meat and potatoes to understand what's going on. And even though they still ran, when Jesus came up, when, Jesus was, when they saw Jesus alive, it changed everything. And so we can see through this beautiful event in the lives of the disciples that four things. One, Jesus taught them and equipped them for the coming change. Two, Jesus told them that there was a coming change and that they needed to embrace it. Three, Jesus showed them the benefits of the coming change, that it was for the good of not just them, but for mankind. And four, Jesus showed them not to be afraid, that they would have peace and that they would remember all that he has taught them about this coming change. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. So I ask you today, is there a coming change that somebody here might want? 
There could be a coming change. It could be anything. It could be maybe the way you live. It could be a, 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 a specific attitude or changing the way you treat others. Maybe, uh, maybe you need to forgive some people. Uh, it could be daily habits on, on uh, you know, reading the word, praying and worshiping. Uh, it could be giving your heart to, to the Lord. It could be giving your heart. Can you, would you consider Jesus? Would you consider Jesus? I want to ask if there's anyone here. I can't have an altar call because we have to remain in our seats, okay? But I can say if there's anyone here that would want to get that power, the Holy Spirit in them and give their hearts to Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here who wants to join the book of Acts? If you do, please raise your hands and I'll pray for you right where you're sitting. Is there anybody? Amen. Anybody? I have one over there. Yes, I see that hand. You can put that down. Thank you. Anybody else? And over here, there's another, okay, I see your, I see your hand, ma'am, you can put it down, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you. Hallelujah, thank you, Lord. Amen. I want to pray for you, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to repeat after me uh, the words that I say, okay? Dear Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus. I know that I am a sinner, I know that I'm a sinner. and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins, and you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins, and I invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Praise God. Two more to the head. Two more. To the kingdom of God. Two more names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Ushers, if you could, please. I'd like those two to just please stand up so that the ushers can give you something to take with you. Okay? Uh, this lady right here, and then I think the lady in the back over here. Okay? Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. If you want to make a coming change in your life, here are six things that you can do. I'm sorry, five things that you can do. <laughs> Read and study the Word. That's number one. Get into your Word to try to set up some kind of a Bible study. You know, I try to go through the Bible once a year. Pastor Ron goes through it every year, I believe, right? For 30-some years now? 1986. Praise God, every year. I don't know how he does it. I tried to do it. It takes me about a year and a half. Sometime. One time it took me two and a half years to get through the whole Bible. But this year I'm on target to get through it in a year. I am determined. I've been through the Bible probably eight or nine times from cover to cover a little bit more with the New Testament. But it's, 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 when I start, I start in Genesis and I go right to Revelation. But it's, uh, if you can do that, if you can just you know, pick up the Bible, just study it, read it, it'll help you in so many different ways. The Maris and I, every night we read a proverb, every single night before we go to bed, one through 31, because there's 31 days in a month, some 30, so then we gotta read two at the end. But if you do that, somebody told uh, the Maris that it owes, uh, I forgot who it was, it was a pastor, and they said that it'll change your life. And it did. It changed our life. Hallelujah. Get involved in a ministry at a church. There's so many things that you can get involved with right here at Full Gospel. There's things that we can get you involved with to help you with your walk. The more you get involved, the more you're going to want to do things. You know, we have women's ministry. We've got men's ministry. We've got children's uh, kids on the move. We've got so, so many different things. We've got trail life. There's so many different areas that you can get involved in. You can have your kids get involved with. Uh, it's, it's, uh, that's number two. Number three. Make time to pray. Always make time to pray, even if it's just a few minutes, maybe five minutes a day. Let me tell you something. That's how I started was with five minutes a day. I go to two hours sometimes, and I don't even realize it. Praise God. Amen. Fellowship with other believers. I can't tell you enough how important that is. To be able to, you know, that's why it's important to go to church. That's why it's important when you're, when you're hanging out with people, hang out with people that, that you know are, are believers in God. You know, so many people, sometimes we, we got to watch who we hang with. You know, my father used to tell me when I was a kid, you want to be a president, hang out with presidents. You want to be a bum on the street, hang out with the bums. He says, whatever you hang out with, that's what you're going to be. Oh, hallelujah. And five, come to a Bible study. We have a Bible study here, I think, starting... This Wednesday, right? Yes. This Wednesday. We're gonna, we have Bible studies here at 7 o'clock uh, every Wednesday. And, uh, whoop, well, there goes, okay. <laughs> Something just fell. Sorry. <laughs> All right, praise God. Hallelujah. Uh, but whatever change you're struggling with, 
God will see you through it. So I just want to say thank you. And today I am reminded of the biggest change that full gospel has ever gone in its history. And of course, it's the uh, coming of, uh, of the, the retiring of Pastor Diane and Pastor David uh, ministry here at Full Gospel Christian Center. They too have laid a foundation here in Port Jeff Station. They have created a legacy that will last a lifetime. This church will continue to get you from where you are to where God wants you to be, which is what the pastor declared the day this, her, this church was built. Hallelujah. And we will continue forward with that mission statement until Jesus comes. The Knapps, too, Pastor Diane, Pastor David Knapp, are also embracing a new coming change. But they have left us with the Holy Spirit. I remember the pastor always saying that, you know, people would come into the sanctuary, that they're not even Christians, and they would say, whoa, there's something different about this place. I just feel something different about this place. That's the Holy Spirit. And they leave us with that Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit will bring to us the remembrance of all that the pastor has taught us all through the years. Hallelujah. They leave us with the peace of Christ. We need not be worried. Our hearts not be troubled. We are not to be afraid of this new coming change. And we will see them someday again in heaven. I guarantee you that. But here's the biggest change that I'm waiting for. Can anybody guess that change? Jesus is coming. When he comes, that is the biggest change that this world is ever going to see. And I can't wait for that day. <laughs> Hallelujah.